first speaker who is uh, Roman Cockett from Curve Node, um, and he'll talk about improving um, reproducibility from meeting nodes to manuscripts using Curve Node. Over to you, Rowan. Thank you so much. I'm Rowan Cockett, and I'm honored to kick off the community presentations at Force 11 and introduce our work on Curve Note to improve reproducibility in research as you evolve and iterate uh, from meeting notes into manuscripts. Today, the way we share science is in PDFs, and it shouldn't be. That asterisk on, on that is go and read the fantastic Force 11 manifesto, which starts off a visitor from another planet would surely be dumbfounded. However, the way we write science is using Word and LaTeX, and those tools export to PDF. So how can we share science in a different networked way if the tools that we use to write science only create PDFs? And so this, this is what uh, we've really been thinking about at CurveNote, <laughs> along with much of the other uh, folks in the Force 11 community. Um, and I want to introduce what, what we're doing, uh, which is creating a writing tool for reproducible science. And our mission is to help with getting science out of static documents. And I want to start this thought in Jupiter. And Jupiter is a computational environment that's used in many fields of science. The tool and community creates many scientific things and quotes that don't fit in PDFs. They're computational, interactive, explorable, reproducible, visual, and driven by code and data. However, to share and communicate those results, it's still mostly done through PDFs, Word docs, and PowerPoint slides, taking a screenshot of results and pasting it into these various documents to share with stakeholders, many of whom might not be familiar with Jupyter. And that screenshot, however, does not come with information about what data set was used. There's no reproducibility baked into a screenshot. And there's no way to update that screenshot if there's a new version or result. It's not versioned, it's not interactive, and it's not reusable. And there's many of these same challenges around reproducibility in scientific publishing. What we're building at CurveNote is a writing tool to help bridge that gap between the computational research that lives in uh, Jupyter, among other, other tools, and how that work is communicated and embedded in these various documents, and helping to ensure that it's versioned, interactive, and reusable along the way. And so I want to show a few of uh, the, the features that we're working on at CurveNote. So CurveNote's a, a writing tool for scientific content. So it has integrated references and citations and cross-linking. And it has a block-based structure that's designed to version and reuse content in many different ways. And one, one of the outcomes of this versioning and referencing is each block of content comes with a persistent ID, which is similar to a DOI. And that gives you copy and paste, which comes with superpowers, allowing these blocks to be reused between documents while maintaining version history, commenting, interactivity. And when changes are made, for example, in a Jupyter notebook, those changes can notify and update dependencies in any other documents. The interaction in the user interface is literally copy, paste, control C, control V. And it's designed to be easy enough to use when taking notes and also maintain that rich metadata as you evolve content into other documents like manuscripts. And right now you can publish those rich documents directly online, or you can uh, use those articles which use this web-based schema to maintain that semantic information and metadata, allowing CurveNote to export to about 350 journal templates and growing. And most of those are in PDFs, because as we know, the way we share science is still in PDFs, but maybe not next year. So our, our vision at CurveNote is an easy to use tool that supports versions, interactive, reusable scientific content from meeting notes all the way through to, to manuscripts. So we have a ton of other ideas that didn't fit in a five minute presentation. So please, please reach out. I'm Rowan at CurveNote.com or Rowan Cockett on Twitter. And you can also follow us at CurveNote on Twitter or send us an email there. So thank you so much uh, for your time. Thanks a lot, Rowan. Wonderful. Please um, 
colleagues use uh, Q and A for questions for Rowan, uh, and he'll answer them. And our next speaker is Rebecca Grant from F1000, and she'll talk about uh, automated publishing for rapid dissemination, the Darwin Tree of Life project at uh, Welcome Open Research. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much for starting my timer. Um, so thank you for inviting me to speak about this project. It's going to be a really whistle-stop tour of what we're doing. Um, yeah, so just to introduce the project itself, it's a collaboration between F1000 and the Welcome Sanger Institute. And the aim of the project is to rapidly publish genome note articles on the Tree of Life Gateway as part of the Welcome Open Research platform. So I'm going to be talking about why this is interesting or maybe a little bit unusual. Um, firstly, to introduce you to Darwin Tree of Life at the Sanger Institute, which is kind of at the heart of the project. Um, so this project since 2018 has been collecting representatives of each species of animal, plant, fungus and microorganism that lives on and around Britain and Ireland and then using advanced DNA sequencing techniques to um, generate high quality genome sequences. So one of the goals of the project is to openly share all of these genome sequences with the public. Um, but also to give credit to all of the researchers and the citizen scientists who have been collecting these species, species samples and conducting the sequencing in the lab. So in terms of our collaborative project, our aims are to share these 70,000 genomes uh, while maximizing access and credit to everyone involved, but also trying to publish them quite rapidly and to get them through peer review. So you can imagine um, with a project like this, where you're talking about uh, 70,000 genome sequences, um, one of the first projects or problems that you run into is how do you write thousands of genome articles um, that describe these genome sequences? And then once you have your articles written, how do you submit thousands of articles for publication on a publishing platform like Welcome Open Research? And so we've addressed these challenges in a couple of ways. Firstly, in terms of drafting the genome note articles, um, we're actually working with metadata that's being collated directly from the Sanger Institute's lab equipment. And so getting that information about the genome sequences directly from the lab and adding it to a human written description of what the, the species was and using this to create article XML. So quite different to the kind of standard process of writing a research article. And then thinking about submitting these articles for publication on Welcome Open Research, we've developed an automated pipeline using an API that allows the Sanger Institute to submit directly to Welcome Open Research. So they're submitting this XML directly to the publishing platform and cutting out the kind of manual elements of both writing and submitting the articles. Um, then the second big challenge with a project like this is how do you get these genome note articles through peer review? So at scale, how do you make sure that all of these articles are passing peer review after publication? Um, so again, a couple of ways to address this. Firstly, we're using something um, that at the moment we're calling machine peer review. Um, it's really more of an automated benchmarking report for each genome. So providing alongside the article some metrics, some objective metrics that allow uh, readers and peer reviewers to assess the quality and completeness of the genome. Um, and at the same time, we're also building a peer reviewer pool. So hoping to recruit a really large group of interested peer reviewers um, who can help us to rapidly review these genome notes. Um, at the moment, I think we're thinking about targeting early career researchers. Um, so maybe working with um, ECRs who perhaps haven't done much peer reviewing before, these uh, genome note articles should be relatively quick to peer review. Um, so we're hoping to build up a big group who might be interested in peer reviewing. Uh, just looking um, at the automated benchmarking in more depth. So you'll see something like this alongside each article. Um, it's a report with metrics, including genome continuity, structural accuracy, and so on. I and mean, as I said, really supporting those peer reviewers to assess the genome note more easily. And this will be available to all future readers of the article as well. 
So next steps for this project, we are hoping to launch our call for peer reviewers, uh, ideally this side of Christmas. Uh, we're still finalizing our automated workflows to get the XML articles into the platform. So we'll be ramping up to hopefully 30 submissions per month in 2022. So that's one per day. And also thinking about exploring potential applications for other data types. So not just genome sequences, but what other kind of large scale data sets uh, could this be useful for? So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Contact details on the slide and I'll link to more information. Thanks a lot, Rebecca. Very exciting. Please use Q&A for questions for Rebecca. And our next speaker is um, Estelle Chang from ORCID. And uh, she'll talk about ORCID as a trust maker, credited accountability built from funders, publishers, and research institutes. Over to you, Estelle. Hello. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen now? Yes. I mean, I mean, um, can you see? Um, it says that you started screen sharing. I don't okay. see the slides yet. Okay. Probably I need to turn off my camera just for better connections. Let me do that. So can yeah, you see my yeah. screen? Yes. Now, now it's coming. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. good. Yes. I'm going to start. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Esther Chen. I'm the ORCID Engagement Manager for Global Direct Members. So it's a pleasure to be here today to share a bit more about ORCID as a trust marker, about credit and accountability built from funders, publishers, and research institutes. So I think the question to be addressed today is mainly about the trustworthiness of an ORCID record. Of course, first and foremost, the content of the data in OK record can tell you a lot about its trustworthiness. And OK provides a mechanism for researchers to connect with trusted organizations that can help them to update or their OK records through a validated workflow. And users of OK data judge the region and trustworthiness of information in those OK records by recording and disclosing the provenance of each and every assertion. But I think the fundamental question will be how to interpret information stored in an ORCID record. So ORCID engenders trust by balancing research control and data quality. So we all know that most names are not unique and they are actually quite ambiguous. So both individuals, organizations can use different names during their careers or research workflow. So ORCID, the central principle at ORCID is about research, researcher control. So it means trust and participation from researchers and it helps ORCID to gain a wider uptake and validation um, from different researchers globally. But to balance research control with data quality, we utilize a distributed increment trust model, which allows reliable data to validate from different members. And we do have a blog post to share those uh, in more details. And the users of K data can actually determine the trustworthiness of those records by looking for trust markers. So trust markers actually include uh, some, so like affiliation added by research institutes or different research outputs, works like journal articles or book chapters, proceedings added by publishers or repositories or different links to different uh, author uh, or person identifiers. The provenance of each assertion is indicated in both in the ORCID user interface and API responses. Again, we also have a dedicated blog post to uh, disclose more details. And then you, as you can see from the right hand side screenshot, so the first is about actually about uh, the sources from researchers themselves. And as for the work part, you can see the source is from the research institutes. So it helps to, it's kind of the trust marker. So you can uh, definitely judge the region and uh, whether it's something validated from a more authoritative source. And a closer look at those examples, those trust makers, so I pick three. So for affiliations, now we have four to 
4.2 million records with the affiliation. That's about 33, around 33 percent orchid, with our member organizations adding around 9 percent of them. And uh, in fact, 80 percent of our works now in the orchid registry are added by members, so both from publishers, research institutes, or different databases. And as for funding, around 36 of funding records are added by our members. So in general, over the past year, about 41% percentage of ORCI members are adding information to the ORCI registry, and we'll keep working with them to add the codes to that. And uh, I think as a non independent identifier, ORCI inherently open to everyone who may find ORCI useful. So open, transparent, and inclusive are all kids' important values. So we are open to anyone engaging in research, scholarship, or innovation. But this, uh, a natural consequence of such approach is that bad actors may choose to sell other information that is not so correct, either in the pursuit of financial gain or you know, trying to commit any fraud or probably both. But however, we believe, and it's the right, on the right track, for the orchid data, credit and accountability will be built on those assertions made by different members, funders, published research institutes. So uh, the left hand side, just some screenshots to share some of the feedback we found at our Twitter. So yeah, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm happy to take questions or just feel free to contact me directly. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. And, and we are answering questions in writing. Apologies for that because we have a lot of talks today. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce Maria Levchenko from uh, European C and uh, EMBL LEBI, uh, who will talk about building trust in preprints with uh, discovery tools of the future. So over to you, Maria. And you're okay. muted. Huh? Yes. Can you see my slides? OK. Yes. Brilliant. So today I wanted to talk about building trust in preprints, what the indicators of trust for research can be beyond journal peer review, and how open research infrastructure can help incorporate them with the discovery tools that we hope to build in the future. <clears throat> So, um, uh, sorry, I can't seem to see my slides. Um, can I just ask that it's still uh, visible? Yes, we can yes. see indicators of trust. Um, it's a bit for me. Sorry, um, getting on with this. Um, so first, I wanted to talk about trust in research more generally, because often journal organized peer review is cited as a single indicator of trust for a publication. Um, what I wanted to look at was what can we look um, beyond um, journal peer review at? And so these are some of the um, things that I believe um, help us evaluate a publication as trustworthiness. Um, open data will allow us to examine the evidence behind the claims, reproducible code and comprehensive methods are crucial for reproducibility, information on funding or potential conflicts of interest, open authors and affiliations metadata makes research more transparent. Ability to make changes to the publication content and status through retractions, withdrawals or new versions allows science to correct itself. Open citations and access to citation context can help us see how others have reused the findings. Open peer review, whether community or journal organized, allows us to see the study limitations through the expert eyes for ourselves. And expert curation and recommendation services that are starting to emerge provide lists of must-read scientific studies of interest to the community. This list of trust indicators is by no means exhaustive, but Interestingly, all of these already apply to preprints, and that means that we already have some ways to evaluate the science that's presented in the preprints, even in the absence of the traditional peer review. So we have a chance to create a fair, open and reliable system for preprints that avoids the pitfalls that the traditional peer review brings. How can open research infrastructure help in this process and what role should it play in the future? Now, the view that I present here today is that of EuroPMC. Um, it's an open life sciences literature database developed by the European Bioinformatics Institute. EuroPMC is a repository of choice for many science funders and a partner in PubMed Central International Archive Network. 
The relation that we have with preprints is that since 2018, we index life science preprints alongside journal articles um, with abstracts and metadata available for over 370,000 preprints from 21 different platforms. In addition, Europe PMC also indexes the full text for over 25,000 COVID-19 related preprints. From the start, in Europe PMC, preprints are treated as first-class research outputs. This means that they're incorporated into the knowledge graph alongside peer-reviewed publications and are enriched with all of the additional data benefiting from the existing infrastructure. This allows us to display many of the trust indicators that I've listed for preprints and uh, provide a way to find preprints based on these indicators, supporting both preprint discovery and evaluation. Preprints in Europe PMC are linked to underlying data, smart citations, peer review materials, funding, ORCID author IDs, and more. Preprint versions are linked to each other and to the journal published version where possible. Now for the reader, this information is presented on the preprint page, which includes figures and full text where available, links to versions and journal published article, data section that includes biological data presented in the preprint, links to community peer reviews, funding information, or even preprint status changes such as preprint withdrawals or removals. Now, um, this is where we are now, but what does the future of preprint discovery look for us and what do we need for it to happen? Um, first of all, just like science itself, preprints represent a global discourse and therefore it is imperative for us to be able to handle preprints in multiple languages. We would also like to look at the evolution of preprints beyond versioning, providing information on peer review status to the readers, and also indexing and displaying the full text of preprint reviews. To support development of innovative discovery tools for preprints, adding license information will be crucial for any reviews. And finally, labeling curated and reviewed preprints in search results can highlight preprints recommended by the community. Now, for Europe PMC, the roadmap for preprints looks busy, and we would love to address all of the points in due time with help from our partners and collaborators. But the important thing is that none of the points raised can and should be done by us alone. Developing new tools for preprint discovery requires joint groundwork of developing community standards, producing high quality open metadata and implementing open protocols to share preprint related information. The table on this slide highlights the metadata that is shared by preprint platforms through a single robust service like Crossref. In bold is the metadata we require for indexing, but information presented in all of the rows is important if we want to build trust in preprints as research objects. Our wish is to see this table become fully green and significantly expanded, and we hope that this presentation can start a discussion on the new approaches to preprint discovery and evaluation. Building trust in preprints will be long, but we already have all the necessary components to make it work. So we hope to see that future come to life. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Maria. Very exciting. Um, so if you have questions for Maria, please type them in the chat and uh, Rowan and Estelle, if you could answer your questions. And I don't see our next speaker in the room. If you are here, Nation Atero, please uh, raise a hand there. If not, and um, if you don't mind, uh, let's maybe move to the next speaker who is uh, Madalina um, Mandache and Kevin uh, Alvaro Handoko from um, International Federation of Medical Students Associations. Uh, and they will talk about developing peer-to-peer -peer research educational activities. Uh, Thank you very much, Irina. Uh, please let me know if the slides are okay. Thank you. Oh, well, well, I can see them, but they're not in a presentation mode yet. Oh, now, now they are, yes, perfect. Thank you very much. So hello everyone, my name is Madalina Lamandake and I represent the License Officer for Medical Education Issues at IPMSA, the International Federation of Medical Students Association, and together with Kevin Alvaro Handoko, we have prepared a paper on developing peer-to-peer -peer research educational activities. So about FMSA, the International Federation of Medical Students Association is one of the oldest student-led associations in the world. It was actually founded in 1951 with the aim to offer opportunities and growth for the future physicians. So we actually represent at the current moment 1.4 million medical students in the whole world. We have represent representatives from over 120 countries and we have more than 130 national member organizations. 
So um, this abstract is on behalf of SCORI, which is the Standing Committee on Research Education, which was actually founded in 1991 under a different name, and it gained the name of SCORI in 1998. This Standing Committee actually offered the opportunity to do foreign research, to attend to foreign research project between seven to eight weeks, and over 2,500 uh, students worldwide actually uh, participate in for your research projects uh, in a year. We have more than 3,000 research projects that are active in more than 80 national member organization in the whole world. So our primary mission in SCORI is to offer future physicians an opportunity to experience research, to experience diversity in countries all over the world by providing this network to uh, network of locally and also internationally active students that globally facilitate access to research exchange projects. We want to develop both culturally sensitive students and skilled researchers with the intent on shaping the world of science. Um, what we provide, we uh, students that uh, take part in story, do literature studies, they collect data, they write scientific writings, they do laboratory work, they work on statistics and also on ethical med medical aspects. So medical students, as you are well aware, often lack opportunities to learn about research in medical schools. And these barriers are faced in research education within the medical curriculum can be overcome through peer assisted learning. Recently collected data that from the Standing Committee on Research Education showed that although 98% of medical students in the whole world think that research is important in medical education, um, all, less than 20% actually believe that it's, it is uh, sufficiently addressed in their medical curricula. We were very motivated by these numbers, so we created three research educational activities. Um, the edu SCORI's educational activities aim to increase re research education worldwide by promoting interactive peer lead training sessions. Every educational activity tackles, as you can see, a specific research topic in order to increase the knowledge and skills of the participants on this topic. The purpose of this toolkit is to provide a resource for a training session that increases the understanding of medical research by medical and healthcare students. These educational activities and also their materials form the basis of a training session, which will familiarize participants with the knowledge and skills that are essential for them to start their journey in the, medic in the field of medical research. We offer a pre-evaluation form and also tips for facilitators and then the specific training modules, as you can see, obviously uh, with some annexes and post-evaluation form and facilitators notes. Um, these activities are, um, these activities are, you can see, student-led, and they are outcome-based. They are open, and they are free, and they are accessible for anyone that is interested as a medical student to know more about research. Uh, what is our impact? So out of all our national member organizations, 70% of them use our research educational activities to hit at their local level, and 54% of them replicate them in all their active local committees. So thank you very much. And this is our contact information and we look forward to reach for you to reach out to us in case if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Very interesting. Um, and I encourage everyone to have a look. So if you have any questions, um, please type them in the chat. And um, thanks a lot to speakers who are answering their questions. So the next presenter is uh, Nancy Pantica, who is an open science advisor at CORE. KMI uh, Open University, and she'll talk about uh, investigating institutional structures of reward and recognition in uh, open science and RRI. So over to you, Nancy. Thank you very much, Irina. Can you see my slides? Are they like in full mode? Or... Yes. Yeah. Yes, good. So I'm going to present the work that we have been doing for almost the past uh, couple of uh, years at the All Merit Project. Uh, Okay, how do I, where is it? Oops. Yes. So what we wanted to see in the Omerit project is that uh, we wanted to understand how open science and the RRI principles, responsible research and innovation principles and practices are currently valued in the reward and incentive structures. And for that reason, we um, conducted research and investigated two different aspects of it. The first one was that we did a qualitative uh, analysis of uh, promotion review and tenure policy documents from academic institutions from uh, around the world. And then we also conducted a survey, an in international survey, 
um, targeting active researchers where we wanted to see what are the attitudes and experience related to um, 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 traditional and uh, alternative indicators and uh, how we can assess uh, researchers in the promotion um, processes. So to start with uh, the promotion review and tenure sampling, then what we did is that we collected policies, institutional policies from seven countries, and we tried to reach a percentage that would make sense uh, per country and that it would be robust. Um, Therefore, we, the, like on the last column, you can see the numbers that we um, collected from uh, each country. Um, and then what we did is that we uh, started uh, the analysis of the policies and we wanted to discover the most common performance indicators um, in those policies. And then we wanted to see whether the institutions support uh, only the traditional assessment indicators or the open science or RRI indicators. For that reason, with regards to the traditional indicators, what we mean is like impact, journal metrics, citations, so things we've seen in the past uh, that are uh, very popular uh, by now. And then with regards to open science and uh, RRI indicators, we got some from the MORI project and uh, the list that they have uh, created. <clears throat> um, so from the results, we can see that the traditional indicators, for example, service to the profession or a number of publications or impact were like uh, more popular. And then we see that uh, alternative indicators such as uh, citizen science, open access, open data um, are not uh, that common. And uh, we also divided the institutions into three tiers because we got, and we did that uh, with the help of the Times Higher Education World University rankings. And uh, we divided them in low, middle and high tier institutions. And uh, from this graph, we have, um, we can conclude that there are no differences in the ranking and it does not affect the presence or absence of uh, those indicators. Then apart from the um, PRT policy survey, what we have also done is uh, uh, from the policies analysis, we have also um, done a survey. And uh, the people who we have uh, sent a survey were active researchers who had published a research paper who were under a research contract and um, uh, we collected information from uh, the core uh, data set uh, and uh, we sent it uh, over to uh, 60,500 researchers and our survey included 15 closed-ended and 16 uh, open-ended questions and um, what we discovered was that um, I mean, the survey has a lot of uh, content and uh, we present this at the deliverable and we are also uh, uh, going to publish a paper soon about it. But uh, we have looked at the institutional activities in making the promotion decisions. And uh, what we see again is that uh, the uh, top three most common answers is generating funding, publishing highly regarded journals and uh, generating high quality publications which are uh, traditional indicators. And then when we move to, oops, sorry. So that's the institutional one that we did. And then we did the personal activities again, uh, something similar to the previous one. And we see that generating high quality publications, mentoring PhDs and postdocs, and being collegial, helpful and respectful are the most, the top three uh, most popular responses. So what we can see is that uh, the uh, indicators are, um, uh, the most traditional ones that uh, are still uh, most popular. And then we have also seen, um, tried to make comparisons between the personal and institutional opinions. And uh, we still see that the difference is uh, the one that um, uh, relates to engaging with the public, mentoring PhDs and postdocs, contributing to peer review. So what we can see, is that the researchers are still trying to value on open science and uh, RRI components, 
uh, but this has not yet uh, propagated into practice and uh, the extent that uh, we should expect. And our recommendation is uh, therefore to continue further raising awareness and credibility uh, with regards to open science and RRI approaches. And here is the last slide uh, information about the project. And thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Nancy. Very interesting. Um, please type your questions in a QA. and a uh, And uh, Madalina and Kevin, uh, there is a question for you. If you could please type uh, an answer in there. And um, it's my pleasure to present Dr. Priya Silverstein from Syracuse University, who will talk about uh, introducing the journal editor's discussion interface, Jerry. Over to you. Um, sorry, this is uh, the first time I'm sharing on this computer, so I didn't realize that I had to change my settings and things. Um, is it possible that maybe if the next person's ready, they could go first? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think we can do that. So, um, if uh, you don't mind, Nina, then um, you, you'll go next. And uh, Nina Vice Fighter is from uh, Helm. Holds uh, Association uh, Open Science Office, and she'll talk about discovering trustworthy data repositories with RISV data, the registry of research data repositories. Over to you, Nina. Exactly. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, hello, welcome everyone, also from my side. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today uh, for the session. Um, as Irina already introduced me, I'm Nina Weisweiler. I'm working for the Helmholtz Open Science Office and I'm responsible for outreach and community management activities for the Research Data CARF project, which stands for a community driven open reference for research data repositories. Um, Research data that is the most comprehensive global index for research data repositories um, currently listing close to 2800 entries. Um, the registry website went live in 2012 and here um, on the graph, you can see how the number of index repositories has increased steadily over the years, uh, which is mostly thanks to our reliable um, editorial team at the uh, KIT. Um, so re 3 data covers all academic disciplines and presents repositories for the permanent storage and access to research data. The service is primarily aimed at researchers, funding bodies, publishers, um, but also scholarly institutions and related infrastructures. It promotes a culture of sharing and better access, as well as increased visibility of research data, and thereby also supports realization of the fair data principles. So in case there are any data repository operators present right now, I would like to encourage you really to visit with free data and update existing entries or um, suggest any missing ones. Retreat Data started as a project that was funded by the German Research Foundation involving Humboldt University, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and the Helmholtz Open Science Office. And um, then it merged with DataBib in 2013, um, a similar repository registry located at Purdue University in the US. And since 2000, 2015, it's a data site partner service chaired by the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and Purdue. In 2020, the current project Rithu Data Karif has started again with funding from the DFG. Um, sorry, I have some problems too. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so what can you find in Rithu Data? According to our schema documentation, the term repository here is defined as a subtype of a sustainable information infrastructure providing long term storage of and access to research data which is basically our working definition, but we are aware that um, other interpretations uh, might exist. Um, so we use three basic criteria to decide if a service will be indexed in re data, data, um, which are that a service or a repository has to be focused on research data, be operated by a legal entity with an organizational framework that's providing sustainability, such as a library or university, for example, clarify access conditions um, and provide terms of use. And of course, I could go into a lot more detail here, but uh, due to the time, I'll continue with a short overview of our metadata schema. Um, 
that is uh, consisting of 42 categories now to describe data repositories, um, including general information such as the repository name or discipline, as well as information about the participating institutions and data standards. Um, here, a uh, version 3.1 of our schema, um, that you can see here, uh, that has been published very recently and um, soon towards the end of the CORREF project, there will be an even bigger release, um, the 4.0 version. Um, now, I would like to uh, quickly uh, have a look at the new data, reposi attrib data repository attributes working group um, that we are planning within the framework of the Research Data Alliance, RDA, uh, together with uh, a lot of other partners. Um, and the goal is to uh, create a list of common attributes for research data repositories um, that can be reused by uh, all uh, involved stakeholders. Um, the group is not yet endorsed and the case statement is currently up for review. So if you're interested in this matter, please feel free to leave us some comments here and uh, join the group as well. And quickly, um, to the Review Data CARF project. Uh, the main goal is to further develop and enhance the Review Data Service and to position it as a central reference for research data repositories. Um, to reach that goal, uh, we are updating and expanding the metadata schema. We develop further options for automated data exchange, um, for example, to include certification information from organizations like Cortrust Seal. Then furthermore, we plan to build new widgets and API features. Um, and also additional functions to support monitoring and recommendation of repositories. And all these activities uh, will be carried out in orientation on our recently published conceptual service model. These are the project partners that are involved in the project CARF. Um, it's, it's running for three years. And please, for any regular updates, uh, check our project blog. For example, we just published a blog yesterday um, discussing how opens can be described for repositories listed in Re3 data. All right, then a short look at our new model, the conceptual model for um, user stories. Last year, we conducted a survey and organized three workshop sessions uh, with a group of relevant stakeholders. And the goal was to collect um, different important use cases for Re3 data and, and identify potential service gaps. Um, based on this work, we uh, published the conceptual model for user stories. Um, to recalibrate research data according to the current and future needs of the community. Um, so if you are interested in those uh, user stories and in the use cases, then please uh, feel free and just download the model and have a look. Um, and then another important aspect of the project work concerns aspect of quality and transparency for repositories. So to make the quality assurance of research data performed by repository operators more visible, my colleagues at CARF conducted a survey on this topic with a sample of repositories listed in Re3 data. So we are really grateful that we received uh, 330 completed responses and uh, the analysis is going on. So as soon as this will be completed, um, of course the uh, results will be anonymized and it will be made, to the, uh, made available to the community. Um, and with this, I would like to close my presentation and thank you very much. I hope you gained some interesting insights and feel free to contact uh, if you have any questions. Thanks a lot, Nina. Lots of interesting developments, sir. And there is a, already a question for you in a chat, sir. Okay, I'll have a look and I'll post some links in the chat. Thanks. And thanks. And over to you, Priya. We can see your slides now. Great. Thank you so much uh, after that little panic. Thanks, everyone, for being flexible. Um, okay, so hello. Um, my name is Priya, and I'm the community manager for the Data Pass Journal Editors Discussion Interface, um, which is also known as JEDI. Um, so, um, so much like the ghosts of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas yet to come from A Christmas Carol, um, so I'm trying to keep it festive. Today, I'm going to be introducing the past, um, present, and future of JEDI. Um, so the idea for JEDI came from the Data Pass initiative. So that's a voluntary partnership of organizations um, created to archive, catalog, and preserve data used for social science research. So this included representatives from several qualitative and quantitative social science data repositories. 
So DataPass ran workshops with journal editors and um, DataPass members from 2016 to 2020, facilitating conversations about how data repositories could help journal editors increase transparency at their journals, and also the other directions so how editors could make better use of the resources offered by um, uh, data repositories and kind of how data repositories could um, kind of listen to what journal editors needed, basically. So following this, DataPass members came up with the idea to create an online community to continue these conversations. The idea was to invite um, current uh, outgoing and incoming social science journal editors, as well as what we call scholarly knowledge builders. So this includes representatives from DataPass, other data repositories and open science experts. Um, so some members would be asked to help catalyze discussions by starting conversations on topics of interest. Um, the resources that were shared would be shared would be cur curated in one place for editors to reference um, and the discussions would be summarized in regular newsletters um, and all of this would help guide social science journal editors towards more transparent policies and practices at their journal, while also offering a platform um, for discussions about anything else related to editorial functions too. And so Jedi was born. So what does that look like? Um, well, we have a mailing list that runs on Google Groups, um, and in just nine months since launching, we've acquired um, around 300 members and have had around 100 threads on topics including how to diversify the authorship base and editorial boards of journals, models for compensating action editors, word limits, and the pros and cons of open review, among many others. Um, and so these conversations have led to a breadth of resources that we've added to our resource collection on our website. Um, so around 30 contributors have contributed around 160 resources around a huge range of topics. Um, so, for example, following the conversation about the pros and cons of open versus masked review, we included a large section on how to choose between different levels of openness in the review process and kind of different situations in which you might want, um, want more open or more masked review. And so who are these 300 members? Um, so there is definitely a bias towards psychology and political science, the two kinds of um, purple here. Um, understandably, as I'm from a psychology background and the PI of the project is a political scientist, so that kind of made sense with our contacts that we had. Um, however, we do have a breadth of represent representation from across the social sciences, including anthropology, criminology, economics, education, geography, political science, oh, uh, psychology and sociology. Um, and as well as this, we have members from data repositories, data librarians, meta scientists and publishers. So we're kind of able to facilitate these conversations between editors and um, all these scholarly knowledge builders who um, have different stakes in scholarly publishing. Um, so what next for Jedi? Um, we're currently planning a spring, spring workshop, so this will be similar to those held by DataPass in the past, um, but branching out beyond issues related to data um, and the topic is kind of open at the moment. Um, we're also planning to survey our members on how it's going, what they would like to see from Jedi in the future, what, what kind of the future of Jedi could look like. Um, we'll also be doing a big push for diversification of our membership. So um, I showed you that um, kind of the spread across fields isn't, um, isn't kind of even. So that's one of the avenues that we'll be looking, looking at. But also, uh, more importantly, um, the vast, vast majority of our members are from North America and Europe. And that's something we definitely like to change. So we're going to be making an active push to recruit journal editors um, from all around the world. Um, uh, and finally, we're aiming to get Jedi to a place where it's a bit more self-sustaining so that it can survive outside needing regular grant funding. Um, so that's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks a lot. Very interesting. Um, please type in a Q&A question to Priya if you have um, it, sir. And now it's my pleasure to invite uh, the last but not the least uh, speaker, Tulip Witt. Tanag, apologies if I mispronounce your name from TAB, and uh, he'll talk about uh, affiliation support in uh, open channel systems using uh, RAW identifiers. And Ulip is um, an open access platform manager. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Iriana. Um, hi, all. You know, good evening, good afternoon, good morning for everybody. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, the affiliation support in open general systems using raw identifiers. My uh, presentation is organized into four 
parts. Um, first, I'm going to give you a small introduction about the raw identifier and its benefits for scholarly publication. Then I will give you a very brief introduction about open journal systems. I will introduce the role of TIB open publishing in implementing raw identifier support for OJS. And as the last item on the agenda, I will show you the OJS raw integration and what are the functionalities that we have implemented in the current version of the plugin. And I'm so, sorry, Julie, if you could speak up a bit because some people are having sound issues. I'm okay because I have a headphone, but maybe if people are without a headset, or maybe if you could speak a little bit, yeah, now it's better. Okay, so let me see. Okay. Okay, am I also visible in the uh, presentation yes. now? Yes, okay. yes. So I will go back to this um, row identifier. So uh, what is row? Row stands as an acronym for Register for Research Organization. It is a set or a collection of research organizations which are mapped into unique identifiers. Those identifiers are managed as permanent placeholders and can also be exclusively referenced using web URLs or unified resource locations. Pro organization also maintains a web interface where you can search and discover most of the research organizations in the world. Pro registry allows adding multilingual institution names in a controlled vocabulary manner so that the researchers can easily locate their institutes in their own language. This enables maintaining affiliations of international research in a manageable and uh, more efficient manner. Pro offers a freely accessible open application programming interface or a so-called API to access the metadata of the institutions that they maintain. API allows machine readable access to its registry to use its metadata for various purposes. In addition, Ro allows synchronizing the row IDs with various other personal identifier providers, for example, Crossref. Open journal systems is or the widely known the OJS is the world's mostly used free open source journal management platform with more than 25,000 journals using it worldwide currently. It's been developed and maintained by Public Knowledge Project, a multi-university initiative developing free and open source software. One of the main strengths of OJS is its ability to extend functionality by writing small programs using repeatable patterns or the so-called plugins. In a default OJS installation, the publishers receive numerous identifier plugins, such as Datasite, Crossref, or ORCID. Uh, OJS also in includes popular application programming interfaces such as OIE, PMH, or REST. Deep Open Publishing is the open access platform of the German National Library for Science and Technology in Hanover, Germany, which is also abbreviated as Deep in German. It offers hosting of journals for any discipline with a special focus on conference publications. Deep Open Publishing is a non-commercial publishing service which respects open, uh, open publication standards and also especially European data protection regulations. As a contributor for, to free open source software, Deep Open Publishing developed and maintains uh, OJS RAW plugin and makes it freely available for the publishing community. Raw plugin is also available through OJS Plugin Gallery. OJS Plugin Gallery is a PKP maintained set of well tested, stable, approved plugins which allow easy one click installation for system administrators without additional technical efforts. So let me. In a standard OJS installation, the affiliation institution is a free text form field. After enabling the OJS row plugin, an additional form field is inserted under the free text field with an auto-suggest functionality. When the OJS editor types in the name of the institution field, the organization is searched in the background for matching with the row identifier and a list of possible institutions are displayed to the editor. From, the, from this list, editors can click and select organizations and the row identifier will be automatically inserted. If there are multilingual names for the organization with the same languages are configured in OJS as interface languages, then the names will be fetched and inserted without manual interaction and displayed to the user. If the auditor wishes to modify the organization name and still maintain the row identifier, it is also possible using the plugin. This feature can be helpful, for example, in the 
if the name of the faculty of a researcher should be displayed alongside the organization name. This plugin is released under GNU public license, which allows free use of this plugin for any community member. After inserting the row ID, the row logo with the link to the affiliated institution will be displayed under the author name in the OJS article landing page. Um, I have also here linked the demo of uh, the, how the plugin works. You can also access it in the GitHub. The, all the code is free. I will just um, paste the link of the um, presentation in the chat for anybody to use. And thank you all for listening. If you have questions, I'm uh, I'm free to answer anything also about Draw and OJS both. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I am updating our OGS guide, so I'll make sure that I'll include your plugin. That's that's very timely. Thanks a lot. So, Thank colleagues, you. if you have any questions, to to please uh, type them um, in a chat, sir. And thanks a lot, everyone. You've done a stellar job. Uh, I, I I won't be able to present in five minutes, and you you all uh, did that so so perfectly. So we still have uh, three minutes left uh, for any burning questions, uh, and maybe if uh, if you want, we can add with uh, like one one sentence from each of the speaker or those speakers who want uh, what uh, you would like to see happening next year, or maybe if there is something on the horizon uh, that you haven't talked about yet in in your talk. Uh, get some moment to speak up. And uh, I can say that from my side, I'm very much looking forward to adoption of UNESCO Open Science recommendation. Um, Irina, there is a chat uh, from Nashon. He seems oh. to have a connection problem and he's in the uh, general att attendee, I think. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we can make him a presenter. Someone could make nation a presenter. Ah, uh, nation, you you are. Not if you unmute your mic, uh, you should be able. Nation, can you talk? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Do you have slides? Uh... Yes. Yes, I do. So if you could please uh, click uh, share a screen and uh, welcome and let me introduce you. So Nation Adara is from uh, Teta Taveta University in Kenya and um, he'll talk about uh, institutionalizing AGS culture through inclusive social media communication. So over to you Nation. Thank I, you uh, I, I, I don't see your no? slides yet. Oh, no. They're coming. Mm -hmm. Can you see my slides now? Yes, uh, not in a presentation mode. So maybe if you uh, click present. Presentation mode. Yes, now no. everything is all right. Over to you, Nation, and apologies. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, I had connection problems, but now I'll proceed with my presentation, which is uh, institutionalizing ideas culture through inclusive social media communication. Uh, so what I'm going to share is our experience in Kenya at a young and progressive university, which is focusing mainly on uh, mining and natural resource management, education and training, uh, as well as other STEM subjects. And we have used what I call a systems thinking approach. Uh, one of the famous principles is that dividing an elephant in half does not produce two small elephants. So we look at the big picture and ask ourselves, how can we promote GS technology beyond the school, beyond the classroom, so that the local government and national government can have a buy-in and together we can collaborate with the government, local government and communities in disseminating GS knowledge and practical problem solving. That is why I'm talking of socializing science in the science 
in the society policy nexus. Uh, so if you look at the integrated approach uh, through GS technologies, we came up with this 70s because we need adequate timing, testing and tracing uh, of environmental variables and their effects on the economy, on society and on overall sustainability. We also need transparency where all stakeholders are, are involved. And yes, technology is also key to transdisciplinary research, training so that we can build a critical mass and also implementing the fair data principles and ensuring that we can gain public trust. Uh, so when you look at uh, where our university is located, it is in uh, the largest conservation area in Kenya called the Savo, uh, rich in gemstones and industrial minerals. And there is competing as well as conflicting interest domains uh, between agriculture, mining, conservation, and land use for urban expansion. So those are all the key stakeholders involved. And you'll agree with me that this needs a careful, carefully calibrated and inclusive communication approach. And realize that using social media communication is more inclusive involving the youth who are the majority population, as well as other stakeholders who cannot uh, be reached uh, easily if you are to stick to what we call scientific communication instead of social science communication. So as I proceed towards the end, just some uh, demonstration of how we have been using social media effectively, including Twitter. Of course, Twitter has been the main one when we are uh, talking of a wide dissemination internationally. We also use Facebook and we use Instagram. Uh, now you can see after registering our GS Day events, how we distribute this one. And we usually ensure that our university is one of the first ones in Africa to register for GS Day events. Then we invite local communities, uh, basic school students, as well as local government leaders to our events at the university and students participate. This is one of the media posts, Twitter posts by one of our students in uh, the fourth year of engineering, uh, retweeting that communication on the GS Day of 2021. Uh, going back to 2019, uh, having training in the lab and at the same time ensuring that we disseminate the same widely over social media and some chronology of the GSD events we have had at Taita Taveta University. We began in 2015. So this year we celebrated the seventh GSD at Taita Taveta University with community facing solutions. And we do come up with themes, themes that address uh, the science society policy next up every year. And uh, you can see again in uh, 2019, uh, our students together with other stakeholders in the county. And this was the GS day for the year 2021 with this theme that I'm presenting on today. And over the years we've been realizing increasing uh, cultural fluency with GS technology, not just as a subject for passing examinations but impactful position support in the science society policy nexus. Also using very effectively what we call the story maps. For example, this link I'm, I've provided here is a story map that details a uh, more than 10 year journey when it comes to uh, community awareness creation, international networking and promoting innovative technologies. Our students also participating effectively using story maps and I'm happy to report that our students uh, came second in Eastern Africa in the story map competition organized by ESRI that is Environmental Systems Research Institute and this is because of their emphasis the emphasis we are giving them but beyond the classroom they have to learn the science of communication and socializing communication using story maps and social media to reach a wider majority so as I conclude, the four lessons that we have gathered from this experience is that we need the GCN triangle, that is uh, goodwill. We need championship and networking, that is the GCN. And this GCN can further be expanded into the four Bs. And these are the four Bs that are been, have been key. Uh, vision, we must have a clear vision as we train students and 
also involve the community. We must ensure visibility, and this is where social media communication comes in very strongly. Then we must ensure value, and being a member of Post 11, that value through science communication and continuous professional development has been critical. And finally, we must ensure that we produce a critical mass that can impact society. So in our training, we use social media to popularize the training programs and increase the enrollment year on year. Thank you for listening, and it's a, it has been an honor to share with you my experience from Takataveta University, Kenya. Greetings, and happy to be here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Nation, and congratulations. Wonderful, wonderful achievements. Uh, and there will be a session on uh, science and social media at the conference, so I hope we can continue this discussion. Uh, and thanks a lot, everyone, and apologies that we went over time. Um, so I wish you a good continuation of the conference and um, thank you, thank you once again, everyone uh, for your presentations, for your questions and uh, thank you, Miho, Osman, Eva, for your support uh, at the background and uh, have a good rest of the conference. Bye. Thanks, Irina. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.